so I used to daydream a lot as a kid, and now I get paid to daydream. My name is Jean Buga, and you're watching Singleton Stories with Biko Zulu. My dreadlocks. Um, I've had them since 2009. Uh, in old warfare, there's a theory called burning the ships. Um, and how it works is when armies would go to conquer a new land, as soon as their ships dock, they will burn them, the, the generals or whoever was in charge of the military then. Um, and the whole idea was you either go in and fight for your survival and conquer the land or die. Um, so around the time when I started growing my hair, I was living in some relatives and I was entirely dependent on them. Um, and as I was planning to move out, there was a bit of a, you know, a brush. And one of my relatives said, if you keep that hair, never come back here. Um, so I sort of kept it as my way of burning the ship to ensure I never go back. Um, that way I was going to go out in the world and find my own way. I think the biggest risk for me was going out on my own um, at the age of 18. Because it meant giving up the security of a social setup, you know, family. Because even to this day, I'm pretty much independent of my family. Um, I feel like that was the biggest risk. I, I went out on my own. Um, and it means you do not have the security that comes from that whole setup of society. Um, I don't know if I can say confidently that it paid off, but I feel like it paid off in my own ways. Uh, so I'd say that was the biggest risk, to, to just trust in my own path and take it. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's consequences for it, and I feel like I'm willing to pay for them. I just turned 30 in November. I, I can't say that anymore, can I? Because November is quite a while back. I, I'm 30. Uh, for my 30th, I had a party. <laughs> um, it was out in my side lodge. So I had a bunch of friends, about maybe 50 people. My closest friends and some of my colleagues. We had some good performances. Bien performed, Savara performed, Ben Sol performed. Viri played some music as well. Uh, I feel like I've had a really, really good decade in my 20s. Because my first two decades were in particularly um, good. And I feel like in my 20s is when I came into myself, is when I went out into the world and found who I was and you know, found success to some degree. Um, I've also really, really done what I've wanted. I feel like I was independent for the first time. Uh, but of course, as you know, that comes with comes a lot of recklessness. And I've had a good run, but now I feel like with my 30s, I'm more, I'm more centered. Um, I'm more focused on what I want with, with my work and actually just work really. Um, so I feel like it's, it's quite a change from my 20s. I don't know, it's, I'm only a few months in because, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Making my first million, I remember everything. Um, I just, I was just about to turn 23, so I was 22. Um, so the thing is, I went to USIU and I was there uh, because a relative of mine had paid for my tuition. So I wasn't necessarily a USIU kid. Um, and when I joined school, um, it was very clear to me that uh, this was a huge opportunity for me. Uh, but at the same time, because I couldn't afford everything around USIU, what, what that meant is I went to school uh, between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. And during the day I worked, I tried a bunch of different things during this period. Um, and towards the end, before I graduated, it was dawning to me more and more that unless I get something going, because uh, you see the things with, with, with a uni like, like that is, Everybody sort of has a plan. Oh, they're going to go to their parents, they're going to go to the masters. And for me, I thought that was the end of my line. I was at the end of the line with, with any help I was going to get beyond that. So it was very important for me that I get a break before I graduate. And it happened. Um, I still, I was still, all the four years, I was going to school to class between 5 and 9 p.m. and sometimes on Saturdays. And I graduated on a Saturday. And the night before, my first, uh, my first national television show uh, premiered. Um, and I made my first million soon after. Well, I had signed the contract, but the money came in, I think a few months, a few weeks after graduation, maybe six, eight weeks. Um, and it was, it was life changing, to be honest with you. Um, it allowed me to, to get an apartment, to get a bed, to get, uh, beds are particularly important for me because I spent a lot of my childhood on people's floors and couches. So a bed was celebratory. Um, no, actually I had a bed before that, but I got a nicer bed. Um, what else happened after I got my first million? Of course, then two months after I got my first car. So it was really, really life changing. So I just, I turned 23 uh, when I made my first million. Yeah, yeah, something dramatic happened to my life at the age of seven, uh, which then meant I was alone a lot uh, in my life, the years that followed. There was quite a bit of abuse and I went to a bunch of schools in between there. I was alone a lot, which surprisingly helped, not, not really surprisingly, but 
somehow ended up contributing to who I am today because I, I spent a lot of those years reading books because they were an escape. Um, it's also why I joined, it's also why I got into the arts because I joined drama school in high school, drama club in high school, because it was the only club that uh, you could stay in school during the holidays. So I stayed in school during the holidays because of that. Um, and it's how I ended up uh, telling stories as I do now because I joined drama, I was reading a lot. Uh, so I used to daydream a lot as a kid, and now I get paid to daydream. <laughs> so my first TV show was Young Rich. Um, then we had Get in the Kitchen. After that, we had uh, Story Angu, which profiles people who've contributed greatly to our country. So we've had all sorts of people you can think of. Then we had our perfect wedding. Our perfect wedding um, follows couples four days prior to their wedding up until when they get married and we show you the, the nitty, what happens in between. The first celebrity reality show in Kenya was done by us, being Bahati. And after that, we've done Soul Family, such a Soul reality show. Um, we've done Foods of Kenya on KTN. Um, and, you know, a bunch of other shows, Best of um, uh, My Friend. We have a series of different shows and three other shows planned for this year alone. I have a bar. Um, so how did number seven, again, number seven. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, my landlords at the time, it's two brothers, Kevin and Tony, um, we used to drink together a lot. And I have this habit, everywhere I go, I'm constantly asking questions. I mean, even in this space, I can, I've, I've talked to the owner about what things cost and things like this. So we used to go to all these bars and I'd, I'd be at the bar asking questions and stuff. And eventually the, this guy's thought of the idea of, having, of owning a bar together. Um, and initially I wasn't really in it, but it's one of those things you just flow with. Um, then eventually ended up spearheading the project. So we set up the bar in the CBD, um, f I want to say four and a half years ago, or thereabouts. Um, and it was one of those things you, we put everything together, great location was great, Koenange Street, we were in the same building as Snow Cream, and you know Snow Cream has all this history in Nairobi. Um, Koenange Street, next to Nairobi University, you know, there's a bunch of offices behind it, uh, Anniversary Towers at Lyons Fonse. Um, and from day one, huge success. Um, but also, number seven also led me to the biggest loss that I've ever experienced to this day, business-wise. Um, because we, we set this up and, you know, you, you, you open a business and from day one people flock in. And you start to think it's you who's done it. There's a quote, it's, uh, it says, success tricks smart people into thinking they can't lose. Um, and that's what I was at the time. Uh, so very quickly, we went around getting a second space in Westlands. Uh, signed the lease, uh, they started the construction and then I, I flew off on holiday in Europe, uh, came back when it was complete, you know, we had a huge launch party and then nothing. Uh, so month one goes by, it was very clear we were make, it was not going to work. Month two goes by, month three goes by, then I start pumping, on, pumping in my personal money because I'm, I still think I'm smart enough to turn the whole thing around. Eventually I did not uh, and I kept, you know, digging the hole deeper and deeper, throwing uh, good money after bad money. Um, and then eventually we had, very humbling, I had to shut it down. My partners were, so the thing is about my, the partners I, I have is I'm usually the Kimbelembele in every group. So I'm the one like spearheading things, you know, gang ho, let's move forward. Um, that also means I'm also usually the one who pumps in the most money without a care. No, not necessarily without a care, but I, I have an appetite for risk. But that was very, very humbling because we got everything, rather I got everything wrong um, because the failure is mine, really. Um, my, my, my partners just followed me through. Um, the location was wrong. Um, the setup was wrong. We were wrong about Westlands as a party destination. It was on its deathbed at the time. Um, yeah, and it was, you know, we lost money in the double-digit double, double digit millions in a, in a period of about six months. Um, so I retreated and... But there's a lesson I picked up from this. There's a right way to fail. It's quickly, cheaply, and never the same way twice. I don't know if I run away from the loneliness uh, in as much as I embrace it. Uh, I can tell you about my routine now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very, I spend a lot of time alone. So I feel like that it's always um, an escape, so to speak. Um, so my routine as it works currently is Monday to Friday, um, from Monday morning. I'm up at 3.45 a.m. Um, I go to bed at 8.30, so it's not, it's not like I'm a superhuman or anything. I just I get, still get seven hours of sleep. I'm up at, I'm up at 3.45 a.m. Um, I, I pick up my train at 4.30, so I do internal communication with the teams. Uh, we're at the gym by quarter to five, to, up until 5 a.m. We work out for an hour, so I'm done by 6 a.m. I'm at my office, again, all this alone. Um, I'm at my office at 6, 6, 6.15. Take a shower there, uh, dress up for work. Then I'm at my desk at about 6.30, uh, fill out my journal, uh, read for an hour and a half, then, you know, the the world comes comes at me. <laughs> it's usually quite an intense burst. 
I mean, it's just work, 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 work. Then I usually leave at the office around 4, 4 p.m. I'm driven home. Then I'm at my, I meet my dogs in the garden until... Sometimes we'll go for a walk in the forest around here, or Lua or Ngong. Um, then I'm in bed by 8.30. So weekdays, I like that. I'm pretty much alone all through. But then what you find in the weekends, I also struggle to be with people. Um, I wouldn't say more than the next man, because I feel like everybody, a lot of people I know struggle with relationships either way for different reasons. Um, so I do struggle with relationships, but I feel like I also do put my fair share of work. Um, so, you know, you learn how to listen better, um, to pay attention more to your friends, to even when you don't feel like it to be there for important moments. Uh, so I feel like it's, a, it's, it's something I, I struggle with positively, but I also do feel like I'm not alone on that because I feel like almost everybody around me struggles with relationships. My name is Eugene Bogo. I am a businessman. Forbes Africa listed Eugene among the top 30 under 30 entrepreneurs in Africa. Will being successful at my age work against me? I feel like I'm through the worst, to be honest with you. In the first few years of Tamaltis, I have this poster, magazine poster of Malik Benjalul. He made the documentary called Searching for Sugarman. Um, and Searching for Sugarman is what got me into documentary filmmaking because I was writing at For the Nation at the time and I was reviewing all these films. And I watched Searching for Sugarman and I thought, my goodness, this is the best storytelling I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to do that. Um, and I was following the story of the guy and, you know, he released this film, he struggled to make it, um, ran out of money and eventually filmed it on his phone and then found success. His film won an Oscar immediately, goes to Hollywood, wins all these awards. And I was just following his trajectory and I, was, I want to be that. And then I follow his path. Um, I get my first TV show, documentary show, nobody had done it here. You know, documentaries weren't even a thing on national television at the time, as a series at least. Um, and then the next thing, around 2014, 2013, when I've just made my first success, my first documentary, what do I see in the papers? The guy went, got depressed, went off to North to Sweden, jumped in front of a train and killed himself. And it so happens at the time, I'm also sinking into depression. Uh, because, you know, when you've been chasing this thing for so long, uh, in my case, I was chasing financial independence and a house and, you know, just, um, how would you say, just really financial independence, being able to depend on yourself and not being dependent on other people. I had everything I wanted at the time, so it didn't really make sense to me why I was unhappy. And it kept getting worse. And for me, uh, when I knew it turned from melancholy to depression was, um, it became crippling. So I became afraid of everything. There were days I'd be driving out to go to work in the morning and I'd be terribly afraid of what would happen if I drove my car out and hit someone's car and then everything came crashing. Uh, so little things just started becoming very scary. And so over time, what happens is you don't leave the house. Um, so I'd still, and it was interesting because I was very functional. I'd still run things. Um, I wasn't saying this to anybody. I was showing up to meetings when I was needed, but the rest of the time I was just like stiff scared. So if I couldn't drive, I'd get someone to drive me or I'd take a taxi, but just, it became very, um, I, I was just scared above all, and there was just that the sadness does not leave. You're sad for one day, you're sad for two days, you're sad for a week, you're sad for a month, and then it just doesn't go away. Um, and it took a while for me to realize what was happening to me because initially I just thought you start to be angry and uh, do you know about survivor's guilt? It's because um, everybody around me, we had just finished uni at the time, and I can see guys struggling. My friends are struggling, they're trying to find jobs, they're trying to 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 hack out a living. And here I was, things were going right for me, yet I'm the one who's unhappy for no reason, and I can't explain it. Um, and I couldn't understand why I was unhappy, yet I had everything I had wanted. Um, and it was just, it lasted for months. Um, but I had a very, very good friends around me. I remember my, my good friend Muchi at the time. Um, he was the first person to, to notice that something was off with me. And he came and dragged me out of my house and we went camping. Camping holds a special place in my heart because even before I had anything, it was the only holiday I could take. You know, camping is only 500 bob. Eh? And renting a tent is another 500 bob. So you just need a thousand bob to go camping. You cook for yourself and stuff. So it took me camping, and to this day I feel like I still go camping to center myself. It reminds you, money does not equate to happiness, but I cannot see a world where I'll be any happier <laughs> without money. Um, this is, I read something somewhere that just localized it. You move to Runda, but your problems move with you. <laughs> um, the issues I have, I don't feel like they'd be any better if I was starved. <laughs> So there's no situation in life where I pick poverty. Um, and money does buy happiness. You know, there's experiences that you can definitely buy with money that do make you happy. And I feel like I've bought a good share. I 
I'm a bit of a slave to my work. Uh, I would say, in all the years since I've been conscious of myself, the one thing that hasn't failed me is the input I put in. Life has not necessarily been, I don't want to say kind, but like, uh, life has not showed me the input-output element. But my work has never failed me. Um, and I feel like I get a lot of validation from my work because there's, I now have projects, like Soul Family, for instance. You know, it's, it's probably one of my most um, critically revered works. Uh, I have more coming. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's been such a big source of security for me to put in more and then see the output come out as such. Because, you know, it's, and I think it's, it's the same with all crafts. You, you start by, you know, learning the basics. Then you learn that if you put in more attention and more work, the output is better. So then to see me, to see the company that I have with the team, uh, we put in more work, more sleepless nights, more hours, and then see the output, um, which is the reward, you know, better money, um, more recognition, um, um, critical acclaim. So th that for me is a huge validation. But I don't know, I don't know if it's a, what's the word, a, a wormhole, because like how much more can you put in? Uh, because like now we put in a lot of work and I feel like, I, I personally feel very greatly validated by the output, the um, the bounce back of, of the work we put in. Oh man, books, it's quite a few. There's one called The E-Myth, and it's just about structuring business. There's one called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. It's about networking, so it also changed my life quite a bit. Um, it's poor, rich dad, poor dad, it's just about basically how you view money. So the thing about me is I'm a heavy reader. So this, I always feel like there's a new book that changes my life until I read the next one, uh, because I read every morning. So which means I go through, and I'm a very slow reader, so I go through a book every three weeks or so. There's a lot of books that I can quote, but I feel like those are the ones that come to mind right now. <laughs> you and a million people are asking me about no, no, that's not, no. You and all my mentors are asking me about this. I'm not I'm not really focused on finding a wife, to be honest. I have a lot of questions about the whole institution of marriage. Um, I feel like partnership should be should be defined differently. I don't know if I want Here's my thinking about this whole thing. I've always wondered about the first person who went like, I love you so much. I want to get the government and the church involved so that you never leave me. <laughs> it just seems like a really weird way to approach things for me. I'll do that if someone chooses me every day, not because we have a contract. My biggest dream right now is I want to build Africa's Disney. You know, Disney is this huge conglomerate that um, controls everything from television to music to theme parks to sports. You know, they have their hands in things you can't even believe. Um, and at the pace we are at as a business right now, we've just moved from television to entertainment. Um, and we want to delve a bit into music, not a bit, a lot into music. We want to delve into television, we want to delve into sports. Um, and this is, you know, this um, house, that house is everything that pertains to entertainment. So that's, that would be my number one biggest dream. My second biggest dream would probably be <laughs> to be the guy my dogs think I am. <laughs> I don't think they think much of me to begin with, so I don't know. It's probably that's not a very big dream. Sometimes I wonder if they know I'm the one who brings in the bacon. Literally. <laughs> no, but no, to be fair, um, I've had my dogs, Ziggy is the older one, for five years, and the younger one is Suki, is, I've been with them for a year and a half. And I feel like they're, they're, they're my family, you know, there is. There's, there's a security you get from dogs. There's no loyalty um, like it. Um, and, and the thing about dogs is, it doesn't matter what day you've had, whether you won, whether you lost, they'll receive you the same way. They still think you're the same awesome being every day. So I feel like I take a lot of refuge in that. I love my dogs. Um, I spend a lot of time with them. I feel like they, 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 they provide a sense of security for me that I don't get anywhere else. Success. Success for me has changed over the years. You know, initially it was it was financial because you want you know you want to have financial stability. Um, right now, what is success to me? I would say storytelling for me is a big part of my success right now. You know, we have this uh, company where we do television and we're trying to break it into more different forms of arts. 
And I feel like success for me will be telling the African story in a way that makes the African person feel dignified. If I'm able to achieve that, that will be success. So usually I feel like I'm chasing a lot of things in my life, so I don't like to chase my whiskey. <laughs> but if I was going to uh, do it as a tonic and, uh, you know, watermelon juice, maybe some ice.